Hey, what's up, George? Can you hear me? Hey, Ryan. Yeah, I can hear you. How you doing? Good, good. How you doing? Yeah, well, thank you. How's your week been? Uh, it's been it's been cool. I'm uh, I'm in the process of renovating my house, so that's why there's <laughs> chocolates everywhere. So I'm just kind of crammed in my office. Um, but other than that, it's it's been it's been good. Uh, how about yourself? Good. Uh, yeah, busy. We're actually in San Diego, and it's like crazy hot here, so dealing with that. But um, oh, nice. You're in San Diego. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, uh, my apartment's downtown, if you're familiar at all with the area. I um, love San Diego. San Diego's a good, a, a top five U.S. city for me. The weather there is amazing. I'm actually surprised yeah. that it's hot. <laughs> that's why I moved there. I know it's like, I mean, honestly, it's too hot. It's like 90 degrees, but that's why I moved there. Um, yeah, and this place is pretty nice. Um, cool. Yeah. So uh, I'm just, uh, I'm pushing this live right now on Facebook. Just give me uh, one moment while I get this live. Already got some attendees here in Zoom. For you guys watching, uh, please feel free to hit the, the Q&A or just chat if you guys have any questions. Uh, today, we're going to be talking specifically about uh, different PR tactics that agencies can use or you can use for yourself uh, to drum up some sort of exposure. So I will now let our guest, George, introduce himself and uh, tell us about yourself and what you do, George. Sure, will do. Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, George Bradley, I'm the, my role as a PR manager at Circa Interactive. Um, we're a full service digital marketing agency, um, kind of working in exclusively in the higher education space. Um, so working with the universities, working with the brands, um, my team specifically on the PR side, uh, work directly with those faculty members and look to get PR opportunities for the school um, and those faculty as individuals. Um, there's 45 of us across our company, uh, seven specifically, as I said, on the, on the PR side. Um, my background has always kind of been in marketing and PR. I, uh, Born and raised in, in London, um, studied for my master's in marketing management over there, um, and then moved over uh, to the States um, where I joined Surfer. So that's kind of high level my background. Um, looking forward to chatting more about the specific tactics we use, but that's me and about me and about uh, the company that I work for. Um, we've been lucky to see great growth over the last handful of years, especially on the PR side. So hopefully you can uh, provide some value today to you all. Yeah, absolutely. And, and PR is one of, so just for context, I don't know if you know, the Blueprint Training is a, is a platform yeah. for SEO agencies. And one of the topics that gets asked the most is about PR. And PR is, you know, I understand it, but if I'm being honest, I haven't had enough execution on it to, to speak to it fluently. So a lot of folks are asking about it simply because a lot of SEO links are a little bit less quality as opposed to PR links. So, um, let me ask you this first. At your agency, do you guys do end-to-end -end SEO or is it just PR? Yeah, we're yeah, full service. So we have a designated SEO team. Okay. We're very much working in that realm, building like content, driving links, that content. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we obviously how we, we consider ourselves in terms of our digital PR is to be that really nice blend between your public relations where you're getting that great brand awareness and also on, we, we have that SEO focus too where like you said, getting those high quality backlinks to really kind of holistically work with our SEO team to, to get that nice portfolio overall, really. And now do y'all differentiate between PR links and SEO links internally? Like, do you have a link building team specifically for SEO or do you just use PR as link building? Yeah, we, we have two exclusive teams. Um, so we focus on our team, uh, focus on those PR links. Um, and then independently, our SEO team are focused on that. Um, still high quality, but I mean, more of a quantity link building approach based off the content we're creating for our various clients. Um, so that's kind of how, how we structure it. Um, but two separate entities, so to speak, we, we, we work together to, to sort of come together with tactics and sort of the keywords around what we're looking to, to build our links to in the pages we're, we're driving links to. Um, but we're just really using that expertise to, to get those high quality links and also push that brand awareness too. Yes. So how do you, so, so how do you, did you distinguish the difference between PR and link building based on goals? But so basically in, in a sense that the goal of PR is for exposure versus the goal of link building is for a link that inadvertently drives more organic traffic. Mm -hmm. is, so I would say the, sorry. Go no, go ahead. I would say the main difference really is, I mean, it all comes back to that. The end goal come back, comes back to that quality, but in terms of when you're looking at process, um, we kind of found sort of, I mean, even before I started seven years ago at Circa, that how do we get those highest quality backlinks? And the best way we found to do that is through expert driven thought leadership um, compared to a very sort of content driven approach um, where people sort of 
battling for the content, looking for that thought leadership, current, commenting on current topics. Um, so our processes differ greatly in that sense. I know our SEO team is still very much pitching in the day to day. Mm -hmm. We're just sort of pitching different stories to different voices, to different types of reporters. Um, we're very much focused on the news cycle. We're very much focused on editorial calendars. Um, so our end goal is, I mean, holistically to increase the rankings when it comes to our, the program pages of the universities we're working to. Um, but our goals are, I suppose, are also more holistic in the sense of how do we then use that PR win to generate more exposure through social media or through retargeting um, and just sort of push the name of the, the university or the client out there to, to kind of holistically see that, that brand value, but also ultimately influence those rankings through a link in the Washington Post or in Forbes or wherever it might be. So, so, so in short, PR is driven more by personalities, story, personal stories, link building is yeah. driven more through, through content a assets, correct? Yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. So I, I know that's a crude summary, but it, it just it feeds into my next question. So I know you guys work directly with universities, which makes it pretty easy, right? I mean, there's loads of smart people that are at your disposal for, for quotes, for, you know, stories, for, um, you know, all the different things that are constantly happening with education that's newsworthy per se. Um, yeah. So it's always good to get, it's pretty, I don't want to say easy, but it's, 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 it makes it easier to get quotes and stuff from, from folks like that just opinion based, right? So if you were to take a step back and work in a different industry or even potentially do this for your agency or for like an e-commerce client, what have you, how do you deal with, like what's the first steps to finding that person who is story worthy um, if there is one and if there isn't one, how do you handle that situation? Yeah, no, that's I think, and the kind of thing I was thinking at high level before we even jumped on here is that, I mean, we, we as well worked with folks that aren't specifically in higher ed, I mean, as well, we do this internally at Circa to try and increase our PR, increase our thought leadership. Um, and really the process that we found to be successful is, I mean, it comes back to storytelling that you touched on before. Um, an important part of our process, whether it be internally, whether it be with a faculty member, whether it just be with a, a guy that's running a business at, at, a, at a corporation is sort of finding out really what their, what their passions are. And that almost sounds like obvious, but until you kind of sit down for 30 minutes with somebody and like really pick their brain on what it is that they can actually speak to in a informative manner. Um, and then what I say the skills are that we've developed over the years is how do you then tie that into what's happening now? Um, so we, like I said, we have that really in-depth 30 to 45 minute conversation with whoever we're working with on a PR front. Um, we ask them about their background, their expertise, what they've seen in the news recently that they could comment on. Um, and then we're always looking for stories. Um, honestly, if you, if you think about, if you see any news story that's pretty much trending in the news publication today, you can probably tie that back to pretty much any industry if you think about it kind of hard enough and for long enough and tie that angle back to that expert. Um, and then really the, the key component after that is reaching out to the right person with this, with the story that you think they're going to be interested in. And it doesn't have to be a story about you. Um, that's what we found to ultimately be successful. We work with, um, a number of different experts. They all work within the higher, if they work within the higher education space, they obviously will have their niches, whether it be engineering, marketing, business, um, supply chain. Um, how do we sort of understand where the new cycle is going and how do we ultimately impact their voice into that? So we consider success not to be, an article written all about a particular company or all about an organization. It's just having their thought leadership inputted into that story. is really a good way to kind of get your feet off the ground and, and sort of dabbling into PR um, and sort of adding your voice to a, a story that a reporter is likely already writing, but they're looking for that expert insight. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be faculty. I mean, you, you, we read stories every day that's got folks from organizations rather than those faculty. Um, like you said, we're blessed with the fact that we have those genuine thought leaders, um, but it's really just finding those unique story ideas and tying it to, the, to a person's passions um, and connecting them with the right reporter at the right time and understanding where that new cycle is going. Gotcha. So, so that's a good point. So the, the first thing that you do is, is, a, is a very intensive onboarding, getting to know that person, getting to know their story. Um, so if, if you were hypothetically, again, like what, it, it, again, just, I, and I apologize for putting you on the spot, just trying to push this to the agency level. So if, if I have an e-commerce client, right, um, and, and, and bear with me for a second too. So you would go directly to the CEO, 
the the people on the higher up and try and find out their story and like what kind of questions are you asking them to extract that that type of information for sure yeah i mean yeah so i mean i think on the executive level that's where we would ideally like to focus our attention if it was on that side um i mean honestly how i start every single conversation is what's top of mind for you right now like what is happening in your industry that is ultimately going to I mean, what's impacting your bottom line, but also what is a, a passion of yours? What is a passion of your businesses? Um, and obviously I let the, the conversation flow from there. But I mean, if we're looking on the e-commerce side, it's um, sort of with, I mean, obviously the Walmart trying to be a considerable competitor to Amazon right now, I sort of dig into those stories. I really want to get their mind thinking in the way that my mind thinks when it comes to looking at these key story ideas in the news. Um, People read the news every day, especially at the executive level, but are they really thinking about how their story ideas or how their ideas about their business tie into what is happening um, in their industry that's being written about on a day-to-day -day basis? So I think before we're going into the interview, it's, do, it's about doing a deep dive search into their background and into what is happening in that news cycle right now that they're ultimately going to be able to speak to. Um, I honestly go into those conversations that I have with um, folks pretty much kind of half knowing where I think their direction will be um, because we have a good handle on the news cycle, um, because we have a good handle on the different publications and the reporters that we could ultimately end up connecting them with. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of a big part of it. it it's, it's really, I let, you want them to open up into their background, into their passions, into where they see their company moving. Um, and again, looking at that e-commerce side, I think you've really got to find those stories that are going to resonate with their business as a whole. Um, and I think if you have those top executives, that's really going to be a feasible activity because reporters are looking for thought leadership like crazy. Um, they need it. They need it as part of their role. So I think it's, that's really, you just want to tap into a passion is the ultimate end goal. And if it's just an expertise that works as well, but if you can combine those two, then you're really going to, I think, flourish. Okay. Thanks. So, so step one, kind of step one and step, step two together is not just putting together a personal profile, but also understanding really the, the, I agree with that. That's a really good point. Understanding what's going on around them first. And then when you're listening to that story, you can understand if there's any avenues to tie that story to what's happening or potentially even ask different questions to try and get them talking uh, about some things that might lead towards a conversation towards that. So after that, this has always been kind of one of my biggest questions about PR too. Um, you've got the story, you've got, you know, your strategy figured out. Do you then go out and prospect for media outlets, I, and again, I know that you guys are in the same vertical, so you've probably got amazing relationships with folks um, on a text message basis almost for a lot of these folks, but if you were doing this for a new client or a new vertical, you took on a client that really needed some, some press, um, would you go to like manual prospecting? Would you use something like Cision, or would you still rely on relationships that you have to get them coverage in, in wherever relevant, i.e. like a Forbes, which could be more universal than a specific publication? Yeah, I mean, honestly, my answer is probably going to be all of the above. We use those, uh, so we use Cision every day. Um, what we found to be successful is to have that lens. So with Cision, especially if you're using the distribution feature, features, and I mean, they have I mean, thousands upon thousands of reporters in there. So I think it's a case of building that list in Cision that's going to be targeted and it's going to be it's going to be um, relevant to the industry. But I, I think to begin with, we like to cast our net a little bit wider. Um, we found that to be successful in times just to sort of cast our net. But then as you'll probably hear every person say, a personalized pitch is probably more likely to get you a return. But also by casting your net wider, initial feedback that we receive from reporters can then help us to craft and change our message to see what they're working on. Um, so yeah, we use Cision. We'll do um, sort of manual outreach where we're, um, again, if you're using the e-commerce angle, do some basic searches around what's happening in the e-commerce world, who's writing about it, right? This John Smith, this guy who's writing for Forbes, right? This guy's wrote about e-commerce like three times in the last week. Um, mm -hmm. He clearly needs to be a target of ours. So we go away, we find his contact information. Um, and when you have someone that's so focused on that industry, that's when it really makes sense to do that more targeted outreach. Um, say, hey, I saw your three articles on this. I'm working with this person, um, they could provide great insight, a couple of quotes for your next story that's coming up. Um, then also send something out that's based around your client. Um, 
again, you'd maybe send a more of a, a wider distribution that's more generalized in its content, just saying that you have this person in your database or in your contact book who's one of your clients um, that can kind of speak to these areas generally, maybe blast that out to, to more people and, and see, kind of see what that return is. Um, and we're using kind of more and more tools, Spark Toro is something we have started to dabble into a little bit um, on our end to kind of maybe find some, I know they have their hidden gen website. So our team's currently trying to figure out perhaps not your uh, run of the mill or big name publications that would be the ideal result, but those really like smaller targeted industry publications or .orgs um, or .govs that maybe are looking for insight or looking for a byline or an opinion piece contribution because they're more in need of content. Um, so we really try to blend uh, those outreach tactics to, to kind of, again, cast our net, but also when we think we have a reporter that this guy's perfect, you craft your message to them, you understand their beat, you understand what they're passionate about and how that ties to you. Um, and there's also services out there. We use a, um, a service called Help a Reporter Out. I don't know if you're familiar with it or have heard of it. Yep. Um, but it's basically a tool operated by Cision that, we kind of send out reporter requests um, and you can kind of use that service to um, directly respond to it. And, and it's kind of like just throwing a fishing rod in the water and see if they bite on your quotes. But we found that also to be successful. For, um, for Hero, do you write, do you just go, cause it's kind of time sensitive. Do you just go ahead and write on behalf of the client for those? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's something that we can, that you would, that we on our end anyway would kind of set that standard up front. Um, a lot of the time it can make sense if you're going to utilize Harrow as a sort of main source would be to, as part of that initial interview perhaps, right? I mean, you can always transcribe that and turn that into quotes at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, so if you're saying like, he's given us like some great stuff on e-commerce, um, you see a Harrow request for that, right? How do we turn this into quotes that maybe mold them a little bit to, to match that request and then send them off? Um, but also a lot of the time with Harrow, I think, I mean, not, a lot of them are looking for direct quotes, but we'll sometimes just pitch them and be like, hey, we have this guy or gal, um, yeah. do you want to speak to them? And that can also be just as successful. You don't necessarily have to send those quotes off straight away. Sometimes they are looking for a conversation, which can also be beneficial to, to get that going. Um, so a quick follow-up on that too. I've, I've had weird, <laughs> I try to do a lot of PR for myself in the past and it's weird how much more I always thought too that doing it as myself would be like more personal this and that but now I have somebody who's been helping me do outreach and like on my behalf just like you would do on behalf of the client the success rate has been much higher <laughs> do you it think is, it, it is, yeah I agree. it's funny because I thought it was going to be the opposite you know but I, I mean I'm sure you'll just confirm this but I'm just assuming that's because when somebody's doing it on your behalf they're like okay they like they mean business like they're working with a PR company like they must be legit you know like I, PR companies aren't cheap so they they must be they must have something to say I mean do you do you, do you I mean uh, assuming that you disagree with me just based on the fact that it's like an interesting one we've kind of talked about it internally so like if um uh our team they see something oh like George you'd be good for that um we're like okay well yeah can you uh can you pitch me instead of me sending myself? And honestly, I agree. And I wish I could probably give you a better answer. I think your kind of train of thought is definitely along the right lines. But I think kind of having that person pitch on your, on, on your behalf, um, for whatever reason, has definitely sort of provided uh, more insights. So, I mean, honestly, if you want to be an alias for yourself, then probably go ahead and do it. Um, not to say that you can't have success doing it yourself. I, I definitely have. Um, but I think you kind of, yeah, it's kind of a weird thing because lots of reporters say they don't like PR people, but they also reporters a lot of the time are, they need PR people to make their stories tick. So. I, I, I feel like, I feel like they're just like every other person. They're just lazy. And when a PR person continuously gives them good sources and stories, like it's just easier for them. So why, why wouldn't they like them? You know? Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing. And I think building off the one hit, like, I mean, Harrow, I mean, in general decision, whatever it might be is that relationship side is ultimately what's gonna, um, make things tick like getting like once we get one win with someone it's all about sort of being on their case and building that as you go and i mean obviously like you said we're very fortunate that we can offer them various different sources from different um organizations so i mean on the agency side if you work with a number of clients we like to think it about right we've helped this client with this report how do we now help someone else with them and like basically like trying to crush that efficiency on that side too 
So I, I want to quickly cover um, the pitches that, that you all send. So we talked about set up the, the prospecting a little bit using a combination of precision, um, yeah. RO, uh, manual outreach, and of course, just your, your past relationships. If you're trying to broker a new relationship, basically cold outreach, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you go a little bit more blanket. So is that blanket just introducing yourself, quickly introducing the client, and then basically trying to position that for future, um, kind of like quotes in the future, or how does that work? I'd say uh, both. So I'd say there's, there's kind of two main tactics that you can do. So I mean, we always look at like a lead or a news peg. Um, and so you could either use your client like you were kind of referring to that like the client could technically be the, the lead to your pitch. So it's, I'm working with this, with this person, they're great. They can offer all this insight. And you're, you're pretty much using them as like the bait. So it's trying to be like, Oh yeah, I need somebody that can speak to, I guess you're kind of pitching them as a, as generally. So with the hope that the reporter is covering that industry as a whole and they like need an expert there. Um, that's definitely one way you can go about it and kind of your pitch is the person. Um, I would say, I mean, that, that can work, but I think it's more successful again and coming back to the new cycle idea is the vast majority of our team, the first couple of lines of a pitch that we're sending is letting the reporter know that we understand their beat, even if, we're, even if the same pitch is going to like 20 people, um, by showing them that being like, oh, um, sort of, I don't know, whatever the angle might be, obviously we've been using a, a COVID ton recently um, and a pitch we were doing in for a client in Virginia was sort of around how the Virginia COVID rates are on the rise. So the first two lines of our pitch um, are pretty much letting the reporter know that that's kind of the angle we're looking at. Um, so whatever the story might be that we think that our expert can comment on, um, that we dive into sort of a couple lines about why they can speak on this. Um, and then I think one of the most important aspects of sort of forming that pitch is what we call the unique value proposition, um, which is sort of the last few lines, which is right, this story is happening, but how can our client provide unique insight to ultimately take that story perhaps where it hasn't yet gone? Um, what can we offer that's going to be potentially different to what the other PR person is also sending this report? What kind of, how can we develop that story, develop, almost develop the news cycle. I think we, you can always have the power to sort of inform a reporter's story if you take that approach. So there's those kind of two main ways you can go about it. Like I said, pitch the, the expert and hope that the reporter is writing on something generally and is looking to add to their pool of contacts um, or really be specific about an angle um, and see kind of how they feel about that and if that's something they happen to be writing on and if they like the angle that you're giving them. When, when, you, when you get featured in a, in a written article online, mm -hmm. that is, um, are you pretty insistent that they include a link or is that not your concern? Um, yes, I mean, we have different clients with different goals. A lot of our clients are also interested in that backlinking. So process for that is, I, we, we wouldn't say it up front. Um, and I mean, so generally you can do research on a publication um, to find out whether they're going to link. And if, so if your client is, if it's a complete waste of time with no link, then you can probably find that information out beforehand by going through 10 articles, looking at other people who have been quoted and if they're linking back. Um, but what we found the, the best way to be successful there is to, to let the interview play out. Um, and they probably know it's coming um, a lot of the time because of the goals that are around digital PR these days. But so once the client has had a phone call with the reporter or sent some stuff over via email, um, we'll obviously send over the bio information we want included and then the hyperlink over, the, over their name if it's to a bio page um, or in our case over the school name if it's going if we really want to link back to the the program homepage and then pretty much call it out like, Hey, like this is their bio. This is kind of the, the backlink you want included. Um, let me know if it's possible. Try and give them like, try and almost call them out to let you know if it's going to be possible. Um, and if that publication is linked before, that's pretty good ammo in your book. Um, so say the article goes live and they haven't linked back to you. Standard part of our process is to reach back out say, Hey, article looks great. Um, just wondering if you could perhaps go in and, uh, add this link. Um, if it's a bio page, maybe explain the value and say, hey, this, this will give whoever's reading the story more in information about where this person's come from, why they're credible to be commenting on this. Um, and a lot of the time they'll be like, okay, yeah, sorry, I missed that, my bad, and go in and add it. Um, but sometimes you're not gonna get the link, which is why doing that sort of background research on the publication before and understanding 
um, whether they consistently link or not is. In our, in with, with how quickly the internet's moving kind of off of websites and more into social, are you guys seeing more of your campaigns push into, like, are you guys, I wouldn't call it an influencer campaign, but if there's like a YouTube channel or like a podcast, are you guys doing more of that outreach for clients as well? Yeah, definitely podcasts, definitely webinars. Um, and the interesting thing with that, those is that you almost get a more, you almost get a more wider range of benefits with podcasts a lot of the time. Obviously they'll post them on the site and you can still get that backlink because um, it's a little description below it. Um, when it comes to social media, I think how we're using that mostly is or how we're looking to honestly to sort of drive that more is when it comes back to that amplification of a, of a PR win. Um, you can't necessarily control who's going to click on that through um, the, the publication's website. But what you can do is obviously put that in front of your folks and sort of drive them to that. So we use that, whether it be organic social, whether that potentially be paid socials, be like to retarget who you're getting your thought leadership in front of. Um, that's kind of one way. And I mean, on the influencer side, I think one area that I would love us to look into in uh, um, our VP of marketing here, I know something that he's been talking about is maybe looking at something like YouTube and obviously you have those influencer channels where they have crazy numbers of subscribers. So how do you get in front of those two? Um, I think, like you said, I can definitely kind of see um, the public relations world kind of moving towards that as, as like you said, influencers. I mean, the amount of eye you can get on stuff through influencers is crazy, obviously. So I think that's one way the PR industry could go. Um, but yeah, I think like you said, podcast as well. It's definitely taking up and we hear every day, like, oh, can I do a podcast? Can you get me on a podcast? Um, the awareness around them generally is, is definitely on the up. So I think they could be an important tool in our kit as we, we move forward. Um, anyone also as well watching on Facebook, Zoom, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to drop them in. I'm, I'm getting low on the list of questions that we had, had ahead of time via Slack. So uh, if you guys have any questions that you want answered by George about PR, just go ahead and drop them. So in regards to how you kind of structure these these kind of like projects and, and deals with clients, is it is it hourly based? Are they expecting some sort of like price per placement? How do you got how do you guys structure your deals for PR? So yeah, it's uh it's not hourly. Um so yeah, it's kind of based around an opportunity. Um so internally what we offer, so we have two main types of opportunity that we look to bring clients. We have expert commentary. Um, which is pretty much where our client, they just their quote would be included in a reporter's story. Um, and then bylines and op-eds, so creating opportunities where an editor or a publication is looking for a contributed article type, uh, bylined or authored by, um, by our client. Uh, we actually also offer internally the sort of um, opportunities for them to be edited. We have an editorial team that can kind of help sort of craft those articles to make sure they're publication specific and follow the guidelines and things like that. Um, so we charge by opportunity. So what we kind of see that as is when we're getting sort of serious and interest from, from, a, from a reporter or from an editor that we're going to move forward with that we think fits um, the brand, fits the voice of the person that we're, we're reaching out about. Um, so yeah, there is, a, there is somewhat of a guaranteed sort of outcome. It's not like, oh, you're going to pay us for 10 hours and we got no hits. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to kind of have somewhat a tangible sort of connection to it. And I mean, placements can be tricky because sometimes some of the stuff that ultimately goes live is out of your control. Um, so on the Harrow front, for example, like just sending off quotes on their behalf, we wouldn't count that as an opportunity unless the reporter has sort of expressed significant interest. So I think you can look at it from a placement or a sort of um, opportunity standpoint, but sort of having that opportunity guideline of how many things you're going to be bringing them each month or each quarter or whatever it might be is a good way to set the foundation so they can be prepared of what's going to be coming into their inbox um, from you all. Yeah, for sure. That's actually refreshing to hear. I, I had tried to hire a local PR company a couple of years ago and they were expensive. They were retainer based and PR is expensive. I get it. I mean, the, the, I think just the value of certain placements can drive a lot of business value. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they charged me a lot and basically the results were fluctuating depending on how much effort they're putting into it that month they, they weren't a, they weren't a great company it was a huge regret but it is good to hear that because a lot of times i think with pr you know a lot of companies come to our agency uh thinking that they need links but i tell them all the time like you need pr like your website is not ready for seo type links like you guys need a foundation you need some authority you got to get the, the the company brand out there some people's name etc cetera, etc cetera. 
So we refer them out and they come back with pretty much no placements or just like very basic placements. So it's good to hear that um, there is an alternative method out there because I agree yeah. the hourly model for PR doesn't really work because um, I mean, you just don't know what you're going to get until you do the work too. So it's, 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 it's tough to baseline, but. Yeah. I mean, it's impossible to track them as well, honestly. Like you don't know how many pitch, I mean, unless you're asking them to send you like what pictures they're sending. And I mean, it's obviously difficult unless you're sort of in it to know how long building a list takes, writing a pitch. I mean, a lot, a lot of the time that we spend is really kind of brainstorming to make sure we've got the right angles. Cause just spraying pitches out there that aren't going to the right folks or aren't about topics that reporters are going to be writing about. It's a waste of time. And if you get in charge for those hours, then yeah, I don't think that's uh you're far less likely to see success. You want at least some sort of tangible, you want, those opportunities coming to you. And I mean, I think you have to be a lot of the time willing to sort of admit that sometimes it, it might not come off, but if you're getting those opportunities and you're getting enough of them and they're quality and they're genuine, then you should be getting the return rather than that hourly based. Um, for sure. Yeah. That's definitely not something that we've, we've pushed forward with. For sure. For sure. So George, I appreciate your time today coming on, uh, sharing your knowledge with us about PR. Uh, tell the people how they can find you afterwards. For sure. So you can reach me at, uh, you can come to our Circa Interactive website. Um, you can reach me directly. I'd be happy to answer any questions at george at circaedu.com. Um, as I said, more than happy to pass, pass on any sort of direct um, knowledge that we have or any specific questions to sort of ideas that you'd like help with. Um, yeah, you can find us at our website, circaedu.com. Um, or as I said, my email, george at circaedu.com. Um, Thanks a lot. Appreciate your time, George. We'll uh, we'll be in touch in the future, man. Take care. Thank you, Ryan. Have a good one. You too. Bye.